Uh, so anyway, we got a uh, Ophelus 5, so we're using that on this trip just as you were checking it out. I you know, went from my guts and bought something I feel is overpriced, but we're going to see how it works and stuff. So kind What's of an experience. that, o o Ovilisk 5? Yeah, it's a spirit box, so basically it does a lot of different things, but it works off the uh, activity in the room, kind of the uh, almost like a EMF meter. Uh, so instead of being like a random number generator, which a lot of these things are, this actually is affected by what's happening in the room. As far as speech, you're telling you if there's activity in the room, it will actually do almost like a radar and tell you there's motion or something going over here. So we're, we're going to give it a shot and see what happens. Now, you're going to like this. The room we're in uh, next door, the, uh, we're hearing this annoying beeping sound, which I'm sure you're going to hear in the background. It's like a smoke detector. The room next door, the window's open. Now, it's pretty chilly out down here, not, not freezing. And the uh, the bed's torn. There's uh, sheets on the ground. I'll have to send you a picture. Looks like a crime scene. And they got the window open for some reason. That's the room that's next door. I don't know what the hell happened there. So, that's, but, you're braver than I am. I, 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 uh, I've had a few, you know, supernatural experiences, and I'm not, not a huge fan of, of them. And I feel like if you go out and look for them, you know, they'll, uh, they're more privy to, to, to come and, in, in, and, in, uh, interact with you, you know? Oh, definitely. That's, that's the game. <laughs> that's <what we're> <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully document. I mean, you know, it's funny, little by little, I'm only here for one night that I'm moving farther down. Actually, I want to go to see, uh, I'm hoping tomorrow to make it to the lizard man, uh, museum. Uh, okay. skateboard swamp which you guys have a card for and uh i'm actually bringing them one of the cards uh one of your metazoo cards that it's actually graded i should have brought it in the show yeah, but it's a uh nine five and i'm going to donate to the museum for that so just i'm trying to do that stuff yeah uh, thank you for doing that so no, awesome. don't be silly. that's what it's all about promoting you yeah. saw i had a group of guys stopped in the museum last night late and they were coming out of georgia for a uh oh, what the hell's the card game uh magic magic yeah magic in the gathering they were doing a competition and they stopped by the museum not even knowing that we have the metazoo connection so i actually gave each one of them a uh, metazoo uh, uh, uh card the lgs cards and uh, they were thrilled they were thrilled so i, I sent you a picture yesterday but no i yeah. that in here too oh always trying to promote always trying to keep it going yeah i appreciate that uh we're going to be Next year, it's primarily going to be cryptid conventions and museums that we we focus on. So, okay, um, great. Yeah, I mean, like the it's weird, right? Like, I think very independently of MetaZoo, um, the cryptid community in the U.S. is exploding. I mean, look at what Mothman yep. Festival was this year. It was sure. enormous, right? Um, and so I think that we still have, like, and, and MetaZoo's done very little. You know, uh, in the past three years, I think very little groundwork in the way of really tapping into the crypto community and becoming the crypto communities like TCG. You know, like sure. uh, I think you know we've we've been kind of focusing on the collectors market, um, the players market, which is great, but like our core fandom uh, barely knows that we exist, which is which is kind of odd. You know, that's what makes you guys unique, too, that you tapped into this cryptozoology, paranormal, ufology realm, which is hot as all hell, especially like the ufology right now. I, I get phone calls constantly. I've been trying to get out and do more on that, too. I get phone calls all the time. I, mean, I had a woman from Perry, Texas, call me last week, and uh, I guess it was Friday or whatever, and just go on because she just had these stories she wanted to talk about. I had a, another producer call me from Canada today. They're looking to do another uh uh, basically documentary series and they're looking for people that can you know kind of be like the resident experts and talk about things so i'd have to send him some stuff and write up a little brief for that and which is all good tie-ins for the museum and you know the craziness we're going through with the museum now trying to save the museum so yeah yeah promotions promotion at this point we got to do what we can that's why i need to travel and get out and do things no I'm not, yeah I it's, a it's, huge, it's a huge thing it's a huge thing i want people love this stuff and once you become that niche that people can come and feel comfortable talking at that's uh it's a big deal that's why you know, we we need to save the museum too not to get off on that tangent uh, no it's okay um how you been otherwise all right hanging in there actually i just heard from you you asked about ariana last time you talked i just heard from her and she's doing good health wise 
Uh, she's going to be 16, matter of fact. We just had a debate over how old she's going to be. She'll be <laughs> 16 soon. Yeah, so, peanut, right? Yeah, peanut. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, that's what she, what she had diabetes or something like that. Yeah, we didn't know, and she had to go into a diabetic coma. It was, it was pretty horrifying. So, um, well, I'm glad. Yeah, was... yeah, a lot of craziness. Yeah. So I see. Getting into the metazoo world, we'll tackle some of this stuff. Get this up. I've had some people reach out to me and ask questions. So I have a, a list of questions that came out uh, before you came out with a letter to the uh, metazoo community, which you responded to quite a few things here. So I kind of go kind of go back and forth. Uh, but some of the things they talked about, like they were a uh, uh, very positive uh, outlook on Andy becoming the president. You know, there seemed to be real positive uh, views on that. I think that was a really smart move for you guys. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, what was that a question? <laughs> no, it wasn't a question. There's people who reached out. They were. I asked them, just send me anything you want me to ask questions on. You have anything. But they were asking about that. The, in that whole thing, there were other things they were asking about. Of course, came with the other changes as far as you guys who are uh, losing a lot of artists and things of that sort. So, yeah, you know, the artists. Um, so, first of all, yeah, with Andy, the, the idea is, you know, he'll take over operations along with Shaw and I can focus on things like the manga. Right. And, and building the story uh, around MetaZoo rather than the minutia of day to day stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I definitely step in where I'm needed and uh, sign the things I need to sign and, and help think around the problems that we face, which is, you know, that, that letter was my brainchild um, about how to address some of the persistent issues. Uh, but yeah, and Andy's doing a great job. Um, obviously there are, there are, I wouldn't call them growing pains, but transition pains, right? Like right. he has duties and um, yeah, you know, and, and part of that is, is kind of that, that switching of guard is we had a lot of artists who, um who i love very dearly by the way like i've been working with them some of them for four years now um and who i you know before metazoo was even a thing like i i just basically dm'd them on instagram and i was like hey i have this crazy idea and they're like yeah it sounds pretty cool and you know we, we we created this amazing uh game and aesthetic together but you know people people grow up and they they move on and um and I think that with the direction that MetaZoo wants to go, which is fewer of these ancillary products, um, more focus on just the core sets, um, you know, maybe maybe doing away with a lot of the stuff that is not necessarily kid friendly. Like, you know, Seance, I wanted to make a statement with Seance and we certainly made it, but, you know, it's, it's not one of those sets where, you know, you can show little Billy who's eight years old and say, right. you know, have to explain what uh, some of the art means. Right. Sure. Um, and, and there's a way of doing cryptid art, which is primarily founded in kind of the nitty gritty supernatural without having to really delve into the gore of it all. Right. Um, and we're trying to find that balance, but for some of our artists that that change was not ideal. Um, mm -hmm. and the other thing that we want to do is we, we really, really want to expand the art team. Um, and if you look at Pokemon, if you look at Magic the Gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh, um, you know, they had their original artists and then some of them moved on and then every set they would have artists come in and do four or five cards. And, um, so the, the art contest that we're doing now is kind of a tribute to that line of thinking, which is, Hey, we, we have. 20 or 30 artists all who do unique styles um and we have a lot of famous artists that are also reaching out that want to do you know two or three cards a set for instance um and you know of course if you're one of those artists where you know you've been with metazoo since the beginning it's it's difficult to to see those changes and so you know i'm very sympathetic to um that change or the changes that we're undergoing kind of being jolting or, or not being how they want to, you know, live the next few years of their lives. Um, and then wanting to seek out different, um, uh, directions. Right. And like, you know, and I, I'm, I'm totally willing to, and I've told them this as well, you know, the door is always open if they ever want to come back. Like I've written letters of recommendations for them, um, as they seek new jobs. So there's very little 
from what I've I've been communicated, very little bad blood, um, or or negative thinking associated with the departures. Um, they just happen to, um, I think, come as a as a shock to the community, but very very standard um, happening. I think happenings. I think in the, the life cycle of the TCG once you get past that two year mark. I think it's kind of always been a, a family too. Every time we get together and, uh, you know, I see you guys at you know, certain events. I see you at Crypticon and events like this. And it's always nice to just see everybody. It's like, Hey, how you been? And we all get together. And sometimes we actually get a chance to go out and have a drink after the uh, fact. And, uh, <laughs> and that's, that's, that's unique in any business to be able to do that, especially when you're dealing with artists, people who are, you know, putting their passion into things. Absolutely. I kind of like the dark art. <laughs> it <was, laughs> fits my niche. But like I, uh, I understand that you can do that without being too over the top, too. Right, and and like you know, with the the next core set that's coming out, the the theme is war, right? Um, and so how do you do a war theme and a war aesthetic without adding a bunch of gore and a bunch of other things? Well, you know, one of the most iconic ways of depicting war themes that everyone really knows about is, of course, you know. Um, propaganda type of art which is very aesthetic it's very um iconic looking and so you can you can but it doesn't really dive in it so it touches on the subjects but it never really dives into the gore and so it's more of an abstract way of representing that war um while still having those dark themes to it so you know doing artistic directions like that without showing like a caster you know cut off at the midsection in a barbed wire pit um it is <laughs> it's just a balance that we're, we're trying to strike i think as as we as we try to to kind of get that multi-generational appeal uh going in our in our future products yeah could you possibly even do maybe two different time that's a lot to do but they have like an adult version and then more of a juvenile version too so that we are we are looking into doing like um, more juvenile products. So if you look at what Pokemon does, for instance, they have, you know, battle kits that mm -hmm. are ready to play for, for kids. And, um, you know, they won't have the certain trainers that are considered more adult themed, um, or art that is considered more adult theme in those products that are, are targeted towards, towards younger people. Um, and, and, and again, there's, there's always a way of, of balancing those things, right? Like, um, having, for instance, promo sets that dive maybe into the darker things like our upcoming uh, SCP set, um, but having the core sets, which are kind of the lifeblood of the TCG, being anything that's you know rated NC seventeen, I think is um, ultimately going to hurt our growth and um, our appeal to that kind of that multi generational uh, fandom that we're seeking. And I'm going to jump into uh, the Hello Kitty thing. Now that you've gotten into that, that's kind of going into another direction, which I know is super popular. It's nothing I personally have had, ha ever had an interest in. and uh, But I, I assume that's got a big draw and you're having good luck with that. Although you did have a, they did do it, the eBay and I guess it's TCG pay player, are both are all the same now? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have that correct. And I'm going by what people are writing to me. And uh, apparently they did a, a drop by 50% on the, I don't know what you call it. It's a, a pack with two booster boxes, some special cards, I yeah, guess, yeah. and some other things. Yeah, I mean, and so TCG Player and eBay, they get to dictate the pricing on that. They, they did a bunch of different deal, holiday deals sort of things. And, and MetaZoo, MetaZoo's collector set was, was uh, a part of that. And you see this too, like with MTG, with Magic, they they have distribution with, with Amazon and Amazon will often discount dump. things and they'll dump things and you know, it creates that kind of um, vitriolic reaction in, in the secondary market. Um, you know, and, and it creates bad sentiments all around, right? But sure. you know, but, but you know, the way that TCG player and eBay look at it is um, a great deal for customers and um ultimately putting meta zoom people more people's fans and um mm -hmm. and, it, and it's something that you know like we have a two-year contract that we just signed with ebay um and, and there are ways of mitigating that right like what 
what I want to do with eBay moving forward is um, having drops where a MetaZoo isn't necessarily producing the product, but one of our license licensees licensors is uh, one of the companies that is licensing our products is um, actually dropping the product. So that's in their uh, product line and that their production supply chain. So it doesn't gunk right. up our ability to, to print core sets. Um, but what also will happen is, I mean, the only reason why the, the TCG player thing was upsetting to, to many uh, collectors was because it contained core product, right? Um, and so one way of mitigating that is in future drops, um, we won't be doing core product within those sets, right? So, um, you know, for instance, if we do eBay, Nike, MetaZoo collab, you know, it'll just be MetaZoo shoes with MetaZoo characters, um, but it won't have, you know, the newest set that's in there so that if, you know, for whatever, for whatever holiday reason, they decide to discount it for, you know, Christmas or whatever, it doesn't impact the the market on um, the core product, right? And so that, that's something that we had to see and, and learn from, but, you know, with the, you know, the eBay TCG player doing what was within their right and what they thought was best for the holiday season, um, we want to kind of prevent those kinds of things from impacting our collectors and players negatively. Right. But it's all growing pain still. You don't know when you, you deal with these folks, especially you guys have gotten so big so quick. I mean, has it been three years now? Yeah, yeah. So three and a half years. It'll be four years in August of next or May of next year. That's just amazing how fast it's gone. It just seems to whiz by. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So it's, it's, it's growing pains and it's, it's learning what we, it's not knowing what we don't know. Right. Like, so every new contract is a new, you know, beast, it's a new deal. Um, and there are going to be pros and cons to each of those things, but you know, um, the biggest con, like, um, the biggest negative that I, that I can control is really moving these collaborations and partners away from our own supply chain so that we don't have you know these delays uh moving forward so you'd basically license it to them and they would handle that handle all that on their end yeah like when you know pikachu did um i guess they did batteries right but it wasn't the pokemon company or nintendo producing the batteries it was pikachu on a battery produced by Energizer or whatever company was producing the batteries, right? That's right. a normal way of doing things. What what I tried to do over the past three years, I think, uh, which ended up obviously not being a sustainable model, was we'd be like, oh yeah, let's do a collab with pins, let's do a collab with whatever, and we'll put we'll put our cards in it too. Well, that's all well and and good, but when that messes with the underlying supply chain um and creates delays that's not sustainable right and that's not how most of these uh, tcgs do it <laughs> right. you know hello kitty hello kitty for instance uh the, the vast majority of, of their revenue which is in the tens of billions um has very little to do with, with what they produce um it's more how they license their ip and uh and they're very intelligent marketing and and in those licensed products that are, are produced by other people um and so you know sanrio has done that in a very brilliant way um and you know the i think moving forward we can we can learn a lot from their business model you know there's looking i'm comparing your letter to some of the questions i have here i'm going to go back to some of the questions one other thing i was asked about uh, the pink box, I guess that's going back to the Hello, Hello Kitty. There's supposed to be some boxes coming out. They're going to be a different color. I guess that's the actual uh, box itself. It's supposed to be pink, I guess, instead of purple. So I, th I think in some of the original designs, uh, there was a pink box. I'm not entirely sure if in the collector's box, the uh, I believe that there are differences between the collector's box and the you know, the direct to consumer box, you know, via distribution. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that because I didn't design the boxes. Um, in fact, these are the I believe these are the first boxes 
and a core product that I haven't had my hand in designing. Um, okay. It was all, you know, the brilliant work of our artists and, and Andy. Uh, so I can't necessarily answer that question with with uh, exact details. I don't want to put a foot in my mouth. Sure. Another question similar to that, or not similar, but on the same level, uh, streamer kits. They're asking about streamer kits <laughs> coming out, which I'm not even sure what they were. I had to look that up. Is that basically like a uh, LGS kit? Yeah, but they were for streamers, so they weren't for uh, local game stores per se. They were for okay. a stream opening the product. Yeah, so we are, you know, very very rapidly closing in on on completing those. Uh, there have been a few production hiccups because they contain things that we've never really produced before. And again, we we were the ones that were like, we're going to produce this stuff. So it goes back to that supply chain question. Right. Um, but yeah, no, they they're delayed way more than they should have been and, and right now they're basically priority number one in, in getting them out uh as soon as possible another thing you mentioned in the uh, letter here you'll no longer be reprinting core sets yeah so so you know we did um base set second edition which i think you know years down the line it'll be seen as a benefit because it's an easier way to collect uh, the base set cards in first edition or and certainly Kickstarter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the the fans weren't a huge fan of it because it 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 was seen as an oversupply. Um, so my pivot from that was to focus on, um, you know, hey, printing the cards, but instead of having a second edition, we have special editions of them that are specific to like an eBay drop or specific to you know, big box and target or Walmart um, or whatever collab is going on at the time. And, and um, that again has a supply related issue, supply chain issues that I mentioned before, where right. we had to put all the cards and everything. Um, but, you know, that created those delays. Uh, but it was also, it also, uh, you know, recreated that supply issue regardless. Right. And some people are obsessed with, collecting every version of the card, you know, whether or not it's a big box or the eBay version or the, like, the core set version. But um, I think that moving forward, as I address in the letter, yeah, we're, we're going to be avoiding, if not outright, not doing uh, the, the reprinting of these core set cards in any sort of special editions. Yeah. Trying to look through something else I wanted to ask off your letter here, and I don't know if I didn't highlight that. But you were talking about, I know it's here somewhere. Oh, not doing the uh, pre orders. So making yeah. sure distributors have things in stock ahead of time. Right. Yeah. And, and the pre orders, you know, so th those are two things, right? One is, you know, we have a release date, it's set in stone. The distributors have to have their product ahead of time. Um, you know of what's what's called the the street date mm -hmm. we, you know the the direct to consumer pre-orders that we've been doing um it it's just not as as we've seen it's not sustainable um and so you know we we're we're going to be printing sets whether or not they're core sets or promo sets or whatever um although there won't be that many promo sets other than scp and legacy next year um and what we have in the warehouse at the date of release will ship at the date of release and if it sells out it sells out and okay. so you know the, the original plan with the the, the pre-order um scheme was that or the pre-order um strategy was that um it was a way of producing the exact quantity of a particular drop of product that you know our fans wanted right so that was you know it was seen as a as a smart way hey you know we get ten thousand orders for this particular product we print ten thousand it's to order um that way everybody that wanted to get what they wanted would be able to get it um because we you know in 2021 and 2022 we had the issue of only selling what we had produced but that created a lot of negative sentiment because people would miss out right it would sell out essentially um it would ship 
And then, you know, if we only produce a thousand units of something and there were 10,000 people that wanted to buy, well, now there were 9,000 people that were upset that they couldn't get the product at MSRP, right? Um, but, you know, again, it's one of those learning things where you, you, there are pros and cons to each of those strategies. Um, and we're seeing from like a, a production standpoint, supply chain standpoint, that doing the pre-orders um, so that it can be printed to order just isn't uh, sustainable and it creates these these massive delays. Um, and, you know, so that'll come with some changes, which is we have to anticipate demand. We're going to overshoot. We're going to undershoot in some cases um, with the, the available supply. But one thing, and, and, and instead of dealing with people who are upset with um, with delayed orders, we're going to be dealing with people who are upset at something selling out, right? Um, but I'd much rather 9,000 people miss out on a drop and, and be able to buy it off of you know other people or trade it off of other people a week later rather than having 10,000 people uh, upset at delays on on a product that has yet to ship but was you know purchasing pre-order a while back another thing i've heard about too you guys are doing a tie-in with claire's um so i know that the the sanrio the karami set is going into a bunch of different big box locations um I'm not sure exactly all the different locations. Oh, so that'd be through the eBay TCG people, not you. Uh, it wouldn't be through eBay and TCG player. It'd be through our big box distributors. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So they, that's, that's Barnes Noble, Target, Walmart, Claire's, yeah, GameStop, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you were talking the last time we discussed things was a while ago. I guess that's, I don't know six seven eight months ago i'm not even sure uh you were talking about switching to some printers in the united states has that happened yet or is that something you're still looking to do um so right now a lot of the u.s based printers are have either been purchased by pokemon or are working exclusively with pokemon or magic the gathering or Yu-Gi-Oh. um and a lot of the printers were also purchased by uh, other people in the industry like uh, Fanatics, and so you know Fanatics bought all of uh, the printers of a, of a particular sports card trading printer, and um, I'm not sure how much that's public. So, uh, but you know the there's a drought in printing supply and capacity in the U.S. Um, and obviously, ideally, we'd be able to print in the U.S. Um, at at an effective cost and be able to ship directly to consumers from here. But, but right now, you know, we, we our printers in China, uh, we've been working with for four years and, and they know what we like and we know how they operate. They know how we operate. Um, so pending any sort of massive boon in the uh, printing capacity here in the U.S., um, it, it seems like our, our current printers are going to be our printers for a while. Now, that, that could change and, and hopefully in the future it does. And we've looked into buying our own printers here in the U.S., but um, but right now it's 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 not necessarily one of our priorities. Sure. Uh, I'm trying to look. I'm missing here before I just get into the fun, silly stuff. Uh, Caster Cup events. Did we cover that at all? Yeah. So you know we wanted to do Caster's Cup this year. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't. Uh, we had a few really great towers where I think they were awesome. Um, and we had a few great conventions, um, especially the, the comic cons. Um, but we didn't get enough towers in where we felt like doing a caster's cup was viable. Um, and I think with next year, our strategy is to focus on building up the player base from the ground up at the local game store. And, and doing that before holding some, you know, multi-million dollar event uh, where, it, you know, I think that that would be kind of be putting the cart before the horse. In right. 2022, when we did Caster's Cup, it made sense because, you know, we were small and Caster's Cup was small. Um, but now, like, if we're going to be doing like a worldwide event like that, 
uh, with a cash prize like that. And, you know, we want to have sponsors. We want to have news crew there. We want to have, um, and, and ideally we would have thousands and thousands of players, but we haven't put in the groundwork at the local game store yet to make that possible. And so 2024 is, is kind of the, the focus of building up um, that player base at the local game store level, holding fewer, or sorry, holding more uh, events that are focused on, on, on gameplay with smaller cash prizes. Um, and we view kind of Collecticon as, as a great resource for that. And they've worked with us in the past and they've been an awesome partner in that space. Um, and so, yeah, 2024 is really going to be a, a player focused uh, year and it's going to be a, um, a cryptid focused year where we, we really tap into the cryptid community. So Collecticons for player based events and cryptid conventions and festivals and fairs and so on and so forth next year to really tap into that, uh, that cryptid fan base. I tell you, just you guys coming to our uh, con in Littleton, so many people were just loving the product that it was just, you know, overwhelming. That the, the fact that, you know, Texas Ted was there to promote and talk about it, show them the cards, explain things, pass out packs, bust some packs open. And then, of course, we took him out Bigfooting out to the park and we actually found prints, which was, you know, crazy. And then we sat in the uh, park there and, we, uh, and Ted busted a, a box of uh, Native, I guess it was. And we filmed that and posted that. And people just love that. I thought that was the coolest thing to be busting cards while on a Bigfoot expedition out there. <laughs> but uh, it was just, you know, I think you, you keep on doing things like that, too. Just keeps on tapping a whole new market. And uh, I mean, there's people like me out there that were never card players, never you know, to the, you, you you used to laugh at me in my videos. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. I still don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Yeah, I think you call it Metazoo, Metazool, or Metazoom, or Metal. Getting the name wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and people would be uh, correcting me in there. So Bob is actually one of the ones who used to be really helpful coming through. Well, that's not what it is, you know. Yeah, I think my dad, my dad still calls it Metal Zoo every once in a while. <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, and and it's just one of those things, right? Where again, the crypt community is blowing up. Yep, and um, we want to be the TCG for the crypto community. Um, and 2024 is a completely different beast from 2021. Yeah. Um, where you know we got to focus on on our core, which is our core fandom has to be the the cryptid fans. Um, and it it's. There, there have to be tens of millions of them in the U.S. and, and beyond, right? So oh, sure. it's not like and, and that's growing. So it's not like it's a small community. Um, we just gotta, we gotta be their champion. Yeah, I mean, the, the funny thing I've I learned by being in this, and you know, even when I work for the New York Daily News, I do some little uh, Bigfoot stories or a paranormal haunted location and things of that sort. But it's a very catty community, which I find across and. I found that out by talking to you even about the uh, the card world, how people can be very aggressive and stuff. But people just don't like, you know, people who like uh, the paranormal world don't believe in Bigfoot. People who believe in Bigfoot don't believe in the paranormal world or the UFO world. And then it's caused people like myself to just tie everything together and love the whole the whole batch. So it's it's kind of hard. It's a great area to be into. I mean, like I said, it's it's been huge right now. There's so many people with vast interest into this stuff but just try to keep everyone tie things together especially now with congress coming out and talking about the uh ufo sightings and the stuff that they've right. been sticking off these you know uh, uh aircraft carriers and things on radar and you know actually talking about interdimensional things coming out of cern and things like that it's just i mean i just look at it like wow this is huge that's a huge light at the end of the tunnel for us down the road it gives us a whole nother path to go down Things that you, know, you wouldn't you wouldn't have talked about five years ago now are things that are having you know congressional hearings about. Yeah, and and you know, and there are massive, massive people in the YouTube community like Moist Critical who has you know tens of millions of fans across all yeah. these platforms, and he's starting a cryptid podcast. Yeah. Um, and, and so you know, I said this back in twenty twenty. Um. We are in the very, very nascent stages of American folklore. Um, and 
at what we're seeing with the information age and the internet and all these other things is as soon as it catches on, you know, and I'm on TikTok all the time looking at paranormal videos, encrypted videos. These videos have millions and millions of views. Yep. Um, once that starts catching on, and it already has, but once it really, really explodes, I mean, again, it's almost like having Pokemon in real life. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's it's but it's happening right now. The folklore is happening right now, and so that was really the the genesis of, of MetaZoo was to to you know create a card game and a and a a story and all these different things that were centered around American folklore in a way that I don't think has been done before. Um, and so hopefully we, we've we've caught that wave right at the beginning. Um, and we will become the de facto TCG for that bridges the paranormal and the cryptid and the the you know the metaphysical and all these different things because we touch on all of that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's got a uh, got a huge path ahead of you. I think there's going to be a lot more interest here, and uh, it's you know, and that's why I'm doing my best to try to push it to the community I deal with. And and once I have the time to do it, you know, I, I'm forever giving out just product in the uh, you know the museum, and even when I'm on the road, uh, people once you explain to them what it is, even if they're not into the card game, they love the artwork. They yeah. want that card. They want that's that's something they're going to put in their collection. Because people who are into the you know the cryptic end and you know the UFO ufology, these are people going to have things in their man cave or their den and things up on the mantle would drive their wives nuts. Uh, just to have all this kind of collectible stuff, and I think the uh, the MetaZoo art fits right into that. Even if you're not the player, you know. So, but you're going to get a percentage of that, no matter what. They're going to go like, I want to try to learn to play the game. I want to try this, and you know, they have to be exposed to it. And like you said, it's just a massive, massive market out there. And we're forever trying to tap into it. That's why it's important for us to uh, for me to be on the road like this, shooting videos and doing investigations, and talking to people. You're creating a backlog of, of of videos and posts and 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 content and stories that once that critical mass is reached, um, it, it'll be something that people can look back on, right? Uh, and and kind of like um, watching a Netflix show all in once over a weekend, uh, people will be able to binge watch the work that you've done that that metazoo's done that all these amazing cryptid content creators have done uh over the past few years that may have gone less recognized than they they would have been in this new era and to be honest with you i got a hard time in the beginning when i would talk cryptozoology or be talking you know evidence that we had and we've gotten some crazy stuff and i'll try to throw some of these images and stuff in here when i edit this video but uh and we have people give us a, uh, you know, you can see it on the YouTube channel. and go like, you know, what is this? It's like a child's game. What are you talking about? I mean, they were just offended. I mean, it's like, you know, you try to explain to them. No, no, no. This is, a, if nothing else, you can look at this as a research you know, venue. It's another way to pick up things. I mean, there are some of the uh, cryptics I never heard of. Just, you know, I, after getting your, going through your cards and you sending me uh, stuff from the Kickstarter. Uh, basically, I was like, what is this one? This is one I'm not familiar with. Uh, we like actually were at Crypticon. We went over and we did a little quick video at Popelik Bridge with the Goat Man. And I purposely yeah. brought my Popelik sample card with me. <laughs> I took some <laughs> shot sample card with the actual bridge in the background. I think Bob yeah. actually posted that. So, and, and but it's amazing. like, yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the you know what's amazing is is you find this cryptid, and, and you know you're a, a specialist, but then you find it and you're like. Hey, not only is this is there a whole story behind this, but you know, hell, there's a museum about it in, in right. you know in the middle of nowhere, or there's a gift store, there's this whole little you know community that's based around it, and that's I don't know, there's something special there. And I think you know, if you think back to it, like yeah, uh, 20 years ago, it video games were seen as a as a nerdy thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, the internet was seen as a nerdy thing. I remember, you know, my freshman year of college in 2007. Uh, what really started to popularize the internet was, uh, which was only like 10 years, like truly only like 10 years old by that point. Um, but it was seen as like a very niche thing. But once YouTube came out, once Facebook came out, um, it, it created a, a, an entryway 
into those niche environment, like those niche uh, industries um, in a way where the average Joe could pick it up. Now, now I don't think that anybody would, would call video games or using the inter- internet like a nerdy pursuit. It's like literally everybody does it. And so I think what we'll see with cryptids uh, and paranormal and, and, and you know, UFOlogy and all these different things is a normalization that happens once people realize how cool it is um, and, and, you know, saying, Hey, I believe in Bigfoot won't be like, Oh, this is a crazy person who lives in the mountains. It'll be more like, Oh shit. Like, or excuse me. Oh crap. Like what Bigfoot, like, is it the, is it the Montana Bigfoot? Is it the Wisconsin one? Right. Is it, is it the swamp ape in Florida? Um, and it's like, or sorry, the skunk ape in Florida. And it's like, it, it, it'll be more of, they'll, they'll find, it'll be way more normalized. And I think that we're, we're entering into that era right now, especially, you know, I think, and I hope that MetaZoo is helping with that. Um, and, but certainly it, it seems to be happening on its own as we've, as we've seen with Mothman, the Mothman festival. Yeah. And the, look at how big the Mothman festival's got. That's just massive. Now it's just 20,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. Over, over a two, over a two day event. Um, Geez, I mean, like, it, it kind of baffles the mind, right? Like, and and it was probably only twenty thousand people, a because it was so far away from anything, and b there's no place for people to stay. Oh yeah, that's so, that's a big issue. You got to book a year ahead. Yeah, um, and so you know, you're looking at like if if people had if they had capacity, uh, you probably would have had fifty thousand people there. Um. And so that, that gives you an idea. And that's people who are willing to travel there. Mm-hmm. Right? And so if the people who are willing to travel there constitute 10% or 5% of the people who have an active interest, then, you know, you're talking about a lot of people and that's just one cryptid. Yep. Um, and so that, that goes to show you, you know, those are the kind of like the canaries in the, in the, in the mines that, that th- those are indicators that, this movement is growing um, in a way that I think is unstoppable now. And I travel to a lot of conventions and some I actually will set up tables uh, like Crypticon. I never do. I just wander around. I'll film and, you know, do and just promote because I don't want to be tethered to a table. I want to be able to do things too. But uh, I mean, I'll see the same people from one convention to another. We're talking multiple states. I mean, people that are really traveling. So they're, you know, they've got gas, you've got hotel rooms, you've got meals. That's before you even buy any merchandise or pay for your tickets. I mean, so these are people willing to sp- spend their cash to go out and just enjoy and live this stuff. And I think that's why you're seeing this huge lines every time you set up at one of these events. Yeah. Yep. And. You know, and I think that um, a lot of these, a lot of the vendors and, and a lot of the people who go to these these conventions, I it's my hope that because a lot of them own businesses too, right? They're they're cryptid focused, um, and it's my hope that you know as as the cryptid culture booms, um, that they are you know seen as the first movers and and that um, their their businesses flourish with it right grow with it and i think all the hard work that they've been putting in for for years and years i think it'll pay off yeah it was rough too because a, a lot of us didn't survive well i did fortunately a lot of people didn't survive covid but coming out of covid our numbers are still nowhere near what they used to be uh people are still kind of afraid to get out and uh, i mean people still rather buy things online and it's taken a while to break that wall back down and just a lot of people just work from home. They never went back into the workplace too. So that's a whole nother part of it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. but it'll recover. And, and um, especially as interest explodes, right? I think we're going to see a lot of newcomers in it too. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot more younger people as well. So something I think is going to help a lot too. I, you have a, uh, I hear it's a beta version of a playable uh, online version of MetaZoo? Yeah, Cryptic Clash. So we're working with uh, Cardio um, and they're doing a really fantastic job. Um, you know, and the online client version, of, like the version of the TCG, um, it allows us to put like code cards in packs. 
So if you look at Pokemon, Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, um, Yu-Gi-Oh, I think, only released theirs earlier this year. Um, but with Pokemon and Magic, they've had it for... Magic's had Arena and Pokemon's had Pokemon Online uh, for for well over a decade now, I think, right? I think the first yep. code cards... and I think the first code cards in Pokemon showed up in like 2011 or 2013. Um, or maybe have may been even earlier than that. But, you know, it... it increases the accessibility to um the game considerably right you know especially since we're not quite at the size right now where you can go to any of your local game stores and play a game with your friends or with people that you're just meeting at the local game store this allows people to connect all around the world and 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 play the game um and it also taps into people who may not like the physical card games whether it's Pokemon, Magic, or Yu-Gi-Oh! or MetaZoo, um, but they do like playing online card games. And so if you look at something like Hearthstone, it is entirely online, and, it, and it's wildly, wildly uh, successful. Um, I know if you, learn, if you listen to, to Magic's um, earnings calls transcripts, they, they say that, uh, MTG Arena, their online version is forty percent of the revenue every year. Um, and so, like you know, it, it's 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 also one of those things I consider like a bench a benchmark for maturity, right? Where if you are a major TCG, you better have uh, an online version that increases accessibility. Um, and and we're we're right there. You know, we're going to be releasing. So we're in beta right now. We're going to be releasing it uh, in you know the first quarter of 2024, um, and our code cards are coming with the, the next core set. So I mean, it's it's and maybe even a little bit before that. We've already started releasing code cards in smaller ancillary products, right? But um, and think about that. Like people might people might pick it up um, because it, it, you know they love playing online card games against people. And that's how they learn about what cryptids are, right? So it's also a really great way of spreading information, not just about MetaZoo, but of the, the cryptic community as well. And it's a great way to learn how to play the game, too. You can literally learn to play while you're online. Yep, you could be in your PJs, like I yeah. am right now, and and, there you uh, go. And, and learn how to play with other people, right? Not you're not sitting in some creepy motel room with a weird room next door? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly a homicide? Now I'm saving that for the weekend. It's a Monday. <laughs> uh, trying to think what else I got here. Uh, I think we pretty much covered all the, the real big questions. Uh, we still got to get you guys out now. Have uh, some of your crew come out and do some big footing. Now's the time to get them out. It's, uh, it's not too snaky, buggy, or you know, too many ticks or triggers at this point. How cold is it there right now? Uh, right now it's like 50, I believe. It might be a little chillier for tonight. At night it drops down a little bit. But, uh, you know, I, the T-shirt I'm wearing is how I was outside before we uh, we got here. We're in, we got a bite to eat, then we came back here. We're going to do a paranormal investigation. And uh, can you hand me the uh, spirit box over there? Yeah. Here's the, uh, the unit we got here. This Turn it on. This is the new obelisk we're going to be playing with tonight, just giving it a try out and comparing it against some of the other equipment we have here. Always trying something different. Get a couple of videos out of this one, and we'll see how it works. We've uh, been to this hotel before, and it's a creepy place. We got some pretty weird stuff on the spirit box in the past, so I'm going to try it again tonight. So you know the creepy room next door. Lord knows what that is. <laughs> I mean, literally, it's, it's like super cold out, but they got all the windows open. There's a smoke alarm in there beeping. It's just not a good scene. Just make sure you uh, – you, you don't have to put this in the, in the video, but just make sure you lock your doors because that could also be vagrants. Uh, <laughs> and these doorknobs in this place they literally rattle <laughs> I mean, it's not like, it literally i don't have it here but I, it, they they actually give you i mean this is old school i think it's in my pocket ah, but they actually give you a key i mean it's not like you have you know, it's, it's real old school but that's where you come to get these creepy places here yeah so, i'm sorry my dog just sneezed so i don't know if the that's dog, fine uh, believe it on me <laughs> <laughs> um no, that's cool. Um, I, I'd, you know, with the cryptic convention focus next year, um, I think it would behoove me 
um, and some of the other core team members to really go to those conventions and, and come and hang out and, and get yep. to know people, you know? Um, like you said, a lot of the same people come to the same conventions and they're, they're uh, an integral part of the community and, and a lot of them I haven't met yet. And um, it's just something that I really want to get involved. Sure. Actually, it'd be a perfect thing to do. Come out and we'll do an event together where you, we actually get you out in the field and then you could be kind of less behind the table, worried about signing things and more just kind of <laughs> like knobbing and having wandering, fun. Yeah, you know, literally run, wandering around with a parabolic dish and a thermal camera. So. Yeah, yeah. it's a tinfoil hat on. and <laughs> <laughs> See what you know. We need to get you out there like we did with Ted. Poor Ted, his shoes were getting wet. He had loafers on. It was raining that day. <laughs> he had to fly back. You had the uh, the big event in Manhattan then. Your, uh, oh, what was he had to go back to? Help take down the, uh, your, uh, not bicent- bicentennial, the, your, uh, I can't think it was called now. Oh, the, the gala. The gala, right. It was the gala. He actually had to come up, leave the gala to come down to set up here and go back. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Ted. Yeah, he, had awesome. oh, he had a good time. Ted is awesome. Good. He's a great guy. It was good to see him over and uh, him. Him and Bob too. It was always I always loved, loved seeing Bob picking on him. I remember yeah. talking to him. I, I even talked to him at the uh, Crypticon. I said, "Were you working with Metazoo way back?" He says, "Yes." And I didn't think you were because I used to chat with him online, and he was very good for me. Going like, "No, this is the way this works. This is what this is." Because I didn't have a clue. And still, like, you know, I'm still trying to figure things out. But uh, yeah, Bob is great. Yeah, he is. He's a he's he's one of you know, one of the old stars you've got there. You got to make sure you hang on to him. Yeah, for sure. You've got a good crew. You all do. I mean, the artists that you have. You, uh, you know, I always look forward to seeing everybody at the events and just the you know, the raw talent that they have is just amazing. Uh, you know, the Jet Yates was there again at the uh, Crypticon. I had her signing cards and stuff and doing some artwork on them. It's just amazing how they just doodle something up in seconds and just. You know, Honestly, I can't imagine. Like, I I don't know how they do it. Like, I'm good at picturing things in my head. Yeah. But like, when I try to put them on paper, yeah. it's like I can't. There's just like a disconnect there, you know. Um. So it's 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 a talent that I have like a massive amount of respect for. Yeah, it's uh, a true gift. Yeah, for sure. I can't draw a circle. I don't even like my own signature. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> uh, so that looks so childish. <laughs> I, I came up with my signature when I was like eight, and I haven't changed it. So. Yeah, most people can't even read mine. But. Yeah. <laughs> and I have people coming to the museum because they've seen us on Travel Channel and MTV and stuff, and they go, like, can you autograph the shirt? I go, you really don't want me to autograph this shirt. I'll ruin it. <laughs> and if you ever tried to write on fabric with a Sharpie, I mean, it just pulls yeah. the fat. I mean, your signature is bad enough to start with, and it's just like impossible. Yeah, it's impossible. And they're like, why did your doctor sign your shirt? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a scribble. It looks like someone accidentally rubbed the marker against you. <laughs> Anything else you want to add? I think I've covered pretty much everything that I was asked to ask, and I'm sure I'm forgetting things. But no, I mean, so you know, usually at the end at the end of this, I I, I try to address the MetaZoo community, but I think you know I want to put a message out there and say to the crypto community at large, like you know um my plan for 2024 is is really to get to know you guys and and help you guys get to know metazoo um and i think it's going to be a really awesome uh relationship that we have so um you know i appreciate you letting me come on and and talk to you you know you're you're you've been one of the the mainstays in the crypto community um for a while and you were one of the the few crazy people that said yes when i reached out you know three three and a half years ago or whatever it was and said hey can i send you some cards and you're like i, I guess yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly what are you uh, talking about <laughs> yeah you know just some weirdo from new york city messaging you about this stuff so i appreciate i appreciate all the help that you've been doing and and i think you know in the years to come you know you and i will we'll do some really cool stuff together yeah well i'm always there to support love metazoo and i'm always there to do anything i can like i said tomorrow my plan is to Go down. I wish I brought it in, but it's a you know it's a nine five card. I'm going to drop off and uh, donate to the uh, skateboard swamp. It's actually called the Cotton Museum, but it's the Lizard Museum is part of it inside there. And so, but, you know, if I can get a few more people down there going like, look at that. Look, there's a card. Metazoo. You know, Google it and see what it is. And that's what people do now if they're interested, and it will go right yeah. to uh, your site. So. Absolutely. Uh, well, I appreciate you doing all that. No, don't be silly.
We love doing it. Well, Mike, it's great talking to you again. And if I don't, I don't, I'm, I know someone's going to yell at me. You didn't ask this or you didn't ask that, but I, I think we covered quite a bit. I think your letter really kind of addressed a lot of things too that people were kind of uh, talking about. And uh, yeah, as you know, the oh, that's something I did want to. One more thing, the yeah. Discord. You talked about getting uh, kind of away from Discord and into some other formats. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I think you know when you look at our different platforms and and people are like why didn't i hear about this like when we make a post about an event that happened or a product that dropped or something like that um it's because i made the mistake of assuming that our fandom was primarily on discord and and yeah, some of the, most of most of the big fans are uh but by using it as a tool of communication it kind of gatekeeps you know, being able to put our messages out at large, um, you know, and, and discord was like, again, started in, in geez, 2020, May of 2020. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was just me and a few dozen people play testing cards and talking about cryptids. And, you know, it, it turned into this, you know, massive, massive discord, um, which is great for getting information out to the people that are in the discord. Um, but I think it's really, limited our ability to market the game to more people um like you know we post on instagram every day sure but do we really utilize social media platforms in the way that is like most conducive to growing the fan base and the answer is no right um and, and i think that discord is a distraction um and i and i think that um by focusing on these other platforms we can uh really focus on the work that needs to be done you know and and i love being able to use discord to communicate with with the fans and all that kind of stuff but it's so easy for a message from one of the staff to be misconstrued right. um, and all of a sudden you know a staff member saying like oh i'm really excited for this for what, like when it comes out next week and it actually comes out two weeks from now um you know then a game of telephone persists right where it's like you know i heard on discord that this happened and then you know people will post about it on instagram and then someone will make a youtube video based on the instagram posts and like it creates this chain of, of misinformation specifically because people aren't in the discord and because uh even though there's no malice behind it, miscommunication can happen, um, especially when um, the communication is happening multiple times every single day in a very casual way. And so, you know, you, you got to look at it like these other big TCG companies, they have amazing social media presence, um, but they don't have a Discord. They don't have official Discords. Um, and, and so, you know, we're, we're going to try it. And there might be a, a resurgence of the Discord in 2025 after we've given it a year of, of doing the more standard marketing and communication methods. Uh, but for now, we want to try something new. Um, and, and that that new strategy is, is really direct, widespread messaging across all platforms. Um, and, and that communication is tailored. It's, it's um, specific to, you know, what, the very thing that we want to communicate. There's very little misinformation or, or potential for misinformation. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Actually, I just got a, oh, it's a shipment thing from MetaZoo Marketplace Games. <laughs> <laughs> That's good marketing. That's, right. things. That's good. Things are moving. Yeah, you got you to gotta keep that in the video. <laughs> <laughs> Is that perfect? I yeah. time on that. I don't Working even on it as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> uh now, I've got so many silly things I've ordered from you guys. Sneakers, watches. I mean, oh, my God. Sweaters, Christmas stockings. I'm trying to think of the way back stuff. But, I mean, just I'm digging through boxes in the back room. It's like I don't even remember ordering these things. It's just. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a, it's been interesting three three years or so. Yeah. Uh, a lot of that oh, we... stuff, like the backpacks and stuff. It yeah. was like people were waiting on new product to come. And they're like, we need more MetaZoo. And I was like, all right, I can I can create some backpacks. And people were like, yes. And then, you know, 
So that snowballed and became a pattern, right? Um, and you know, now it's like looking back at that stuff, it's a really interesting part of our history. But you know, um, if we're going to be releasing a sneaker in the future, I want it to be a, a collaboration with Nike or Reebok or Adidas, or you know, rather than something that is print on demand from China, you know, right? Um, so like those things will come back, but they'll be. Like if we're going to be doing backpacks, we need to be doing backpacks with Loungefly, you know, um, which does really famous backpacks with like Disney and stuff like that, Pokemon. Um, so those things will come back. They'll just be more um, higher quality and, and they'll be doing more for spreading the word of MetaZoo by, you know, via these collaborations. Sure. No, I think it's been great. I've, it's been quite a ride going through this and, and just, and just seeing the market go from crazy up to now the corrections, which is across the board, especially coming out of COVID and everything. And uh, But uh, everything's going to bounce back. I mean, it's just, it's. Uh, I think you guys are in a really good position as far as your growth and uh, the ideas and everything you've got coming forward. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a fun game. I, I, the artwork is just amazing. And, I mean, everyone I turn on to it, I mean, gamers or not, love the stuff, so. Yeah, so, you know, just constantly passing it out. So, I, and again, I appreciate all that, and and no, I, no. I'm, I'm really excited for the future, honestly. So, yeah, uh, like I appreciate the the uh, the interview, and, and hopefully we can do this more often, uh, a few times next year. Actually, we could. Yeah, we'll try to do it like every quarter or something like that. And every time something comes up, a good, good good platform for you to get some messages out. Well, yes, thank sir. you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me. No problem. You have a good one, and. Uh, I wish you all the best, and I hopefully I'll see you at the next con. Yes, sir. Take care. All right, you too. Bye.